Thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm Jeff Champion, Risk Professional Practices Principal at Osaka, here to talk about their recently released article, Quantifying a Qualitative Technology Risk Assessment. It's Mike Powers and Julie Ebersbach. Mike and Julie, thank you for joining me today. Nice to meet you, happy to be here. Now, before we get started, um, Mike, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Michael Powers. I'm a senior vice president at a Midwest uh, banking institution. Uh, we're in, in Columbus, Ohio. I live here now. And um, I've been a risk professional for almost 15 years. Uh, background is in technology. Um, I am a C-RISC certified, and um, I've also got my PhD in information technology. So in addition to my uh, risk assessments uh, role in cybersecurity, um, I am also an adjunct professor at three universities where I teach cybersecurity, quantitative stats, uh, and technology uh, courses. Um, I am married with uh, two grown children, one who's a veterinarian, the other one is a school teacher. So very fortunate there to be that empty nester and spend a lot of time working on Isaka products here. Um, I'm also very fortunate to be working with my uh, colleague, Julie Ebersbach. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, also work for a Midwest banking institution and uh, been working in risk for about going on four years now. Uh, background in IT and a little bit of aviation background as well. Uh, I live also in Columbus, Ohio with my husband and my three month old daughter. And I got uh, two cats and a Bernie's Mountain Dog that take up most of our time. That's incredible. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining me today. Um, we'll jump right in. And so I wanted to start by putting things into context so um, our listeners get an idea of um, quantitative and qualitative risk. And so can you tell me the difference between the two? Yeah, let me feel that one a bit, Julie. Um, when you take a look at uh, the types of risk assessment at the highest level, um, you really have one that's quantitative and one that's qualitative. And, and both Julie and I have worked in this space for uh, some time at our company, and, and many institutions basically go with qualitative. The, the quality is basically highly um, experienced personnel making judgments based on an enterprise risk management framework. But the core is you're making a personal opinion uh, on, on the status of risk, and it really is subject to um, debate. Um, it's all based on a framework, but in the end, um, they're typically in a pure qualitative assessment. Uh, there is typically little data uh, behind it. In contrast, you have the quantitative risk assessment, which is typically like a um, using numbers and relying on data exclusively. Now, in reality, uh, many times companies will use a blend of that, but uh, Julie and I have, at least at our organization, have perfected somewhat a, a, a strategy for um, using data to inform the qualitative risk assessment. So bottom line here is also is there are many advantages and disadvantages across the board for each type of risk assessment. In the end, Julie and I look to describe techniques for blending the two to make a, a, a best possible hybrid product. And, and Julie, would you say that's uh, fairly accurate there? Yeah, I, I think you laid it out very well to kind of explain how the qualitative is really very opinion uh, based at times and the quantitative while it has a lot of data and can really show uh, a risk from a holistic perspective it's it's a lot more expensive to do and so our approach that we kind of put together really blends the two really nicely to provide uh, data to those subject matter ex experts and, and say here's some data behind it now how can you use those to frame you know your qualitative opinion Interesting. I want to geek out a little bit. And so <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious with this hybrid, um, how, how I mean, what would be the components of a mesh in a hybrid like that? Yeah, so absolutely. Julie hit on a key point about the quantitative factors. Um, not only do you have a, 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 a struggle sometimes, number one, she mentioned expensive, right? So in order to do qu pure quantitative, you have to have the data in place, you have to be able to collect the data, such as the cost of servers, um, the cost of implementation, um, all the uh, frameworks that are behind uh, how to, in other words, the methodology behind how you get those numbers. Um, in our approach, we take each component, typically in a qualitative risk assessment or, or any risk assessment, 
And you're going to think of it as each has a chapter. For example, you're going to talk about your top risks, your emerging risks, your control environment, your uh, issue management process. So what happens is, um, and I think we have a, a great example in, in our paper, uh, take control effectiveness, for example. Um, if you have 100 controls and 90 of them are effective and you have a framework behind how you rate those, that 90% figure is a bit of quantitative data that can tell you um, what your opinion may be about your uh, environment. So for example, using the control environment example, you typically rate your environment uh, on a three point or a five point scale, let's say anywhere from inadequate to strong. And when you have a figure like, hey, 90% of our controls are effective, what does that mean? That would probably indicate strongly support for rating your environment adequate or higher. Now, Julie, I think you'll know a caveat because I think you raised this in the paper. What is the caveat to that magic 90% number? Well, it's kind of the opposite, I, I think, is what you're thinking, right? The, hey, I've got 100%, but I only have five, 10 controls, and I've got a lot of gaps out there still as I'm maturing my program. So that one, if you just look at that 100% number, you can't really say you have a strong control environment because you may have a lot of gaps still out there and respond and corresponding to the framework. Absolutely. So, so Jeff, you see where we're going with this, right? It's not just a yeah. matter of getting the numbers, it's understand the nuances. And then as you as a risk professional, if Julie and I gave you this data, then suddenly you have A, rationale for that, and B, an ability to make a very uh, defined judgment on your environment, for example. That makes definitely makes sense. And so every time I think about controls, I think about frameworks. And so what would be the two primary standards of qualitative and quantitative risk assessments? Oh, that's a good one. I think uh, you, you can, you'll you have better with um, the quantitative side. For example, the quantitative side, I, I, Julie, what comes to mind is the FAIR model, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is probably the industry standard uh, for all quantitative ones. Uh, then you have like the ALE, uh, average loss expectancy. That's whereas FAIR is a proprietary model, the ALE and things like that are more uh, generic, but they are purely quantitative models uh, informing uh, risk. And they could be very broad, like, like FAIR can be very broad and extensive, or they can be very narrow and isolated to a certain field. When it gets to be qualitative, there are some there that we list in our paper, um, types of uh, CCTA in, in Europe, it's the CRAM method, the risk analysis and management method, failure mode effects and criticality analysis is, no, is another one. And what you find here is these are samples of risk assessments that people have attempted to define. I would probably suggest that the um, quantitative ones are more defined with more structure to them. And then both of those are based on frameworks and standards uh, that inform both of them. For example, National Institute of Standards, NIST 830 guide, and then the uh, ISO guide is there as well. I think it's fair to say, Julie, that um, um, qualitative risk assessments, while these are they, these exist, what you find more often than not in the industry with qualitative risk assessments, organizations make their own frameworks and they define that. Julie, would you think that's accurate? Yeah, I, I, I would agree. While you might use a framework to kind of guide you and kind of get you started it, it, with the qualitative, it's going to more, hey, I've got to start now. I'm just going to kind of ease my way through and, again, take those personal opinions into account as I really lay out what I think the risk is as the as the SME. Yeah. And, and Jeff, let me give you a little more color commentary on that whole thing. I've done risk assessments, particularly risk control self-assessments for technology across three entirely different organizations. And each one, while having a totally different flavor, a different a set of PowerPoint slides and a different approach. They have these common elements that Julie and I described in our article. Um, they have common elements in common. So even if I'm working in disparate organizations, the concept of a technology assessment, those components are essentially the same. They might have different types of flavors, but things like top emerging risk, a residual risk framework, an inherent risk framework, how to map from inherent risk to uh, residual risk, and then how to describe that. And I guess it, it's important to note also in that entire discussion that these elements, um, the reason they're common is most of the time you're doing it with a regulated environment like banking or insurance. And therefore there's an expectation by the regulators that these elements will be common and based on well-established risk principles. Does that help, Jeff? That makes sense. 
So, so with most companies, would they be doing a more of a blended approach? I, I'd say in my experience, absolutely. Um, I think what we've done is in the absence of, you, you tend to have a, a couple approaches. You automatically go for the quantitative approach and make that investment from the bottom up and you invest in the tools and the products to get there. Okay. However, I think um, most companies I've experienced avoid that because they have had challenges with it. It's less than successful or it's narrow in scope. And then they go with the qualitative risk assessment. And then the problem becomes, or the challenge becomes, how do we gather the data? So in the absence of a pure quantitative model or tool set, you are now for doing it from the top down and, and finding ways of manufacturing data that's pertinent to your to your qualitative risk assessment. Julie, can you get, think of an example like that that we that we did in our processes that would be like the control environment example? Uh, where we were bringing in various data pieces. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we look at metrics a lot and, and bringing in the metrics from uh, the, in the KPIs from the various teams, the cybersecurity teams, the technology teams, and, and those are valuable to paint a, a fuller picture of what the controls don't capture. I always think that that uh, helps paint a clearer picture. Hey, here's what the controls cover, um, but the controls obviously don't cover everything, but these help paint a, a more holistic picture to uh, what the environment is and how it's operating. Perfect. Yeah, that's definitely that's definitely interesting. My my challenge with risk assessment has always been um putting that blended approach together, like and um and, and trying to put yeah. controls in place and tr and also trying to satisfy the stakeholders at the same time. And the other thing I'll add in there too, right, is with this with either approach, you get a, a garbage in, garbage out uh, type of uh result if you don't clean your data on either end, especially in quantitative, obviously. If you do not clean that data and make sure it's effective, that's a really expensive uh, endeavor to put together to not get clean results. Um, so making sure that that data is clean, but then you're going to need obviously clean data if you're going to do some sort of hybrid approach. Yeah, Jeff, let me take a uh, pull on that thread a little bit about the hybrid approach. Uh, Julie and I are fortunate enough to, we're obviously in a test uh, technology risk assessment cybersecurity area, um, but we've put together a team. So I have a variety of risk partners that own the product in the end, but we have a centralized group, Joy's a member of that team, who actually writes the initial risk assessment. So when you talk about methods for creating a team, um, the reason this is somewhat unique is that in many organizations, the assigned risk partner um, for each segment or unit is responsible for um, you know, writing their own assessment within within the template. So it's a concrete example, Jeff, would be, I would give you the template as the operational risk manager owning the whole template product. You as the risk person assigned are free to write whatever you want within the organization of the PowerPoint or the Excel or the Word document. The challenge with that is that everybody's gonna be writing different words, right? Even though we have an organized uh, format, everybody's gonna do, do their own thing. And, and, and it can sometimes across an organization with multiple business segments, the collective cohesiveness is, is somewhat lost. Within our technology organization, um, and I've seen this in past organizations too, having a centralized group of risk professionals gather the data you and and put the, the words together, you can and then extend that, that maturity into the writing. For example, um, it also avoids unique writing every quarter or every year when you're doing it. So we have a format, for example, we'll say control effectiveness is X, and it's going to be parentheses 20 of 100, explaining what that percentage means, comma, indicating a X type of environment. So that's a rinse, wash, repeat kind of approach um, using the quantitative data. And that often eliminates uh, repetition or um, starting over when we, when we have another risk assessment cycle. Definitely makes sense. And now in that direction, when we talk about um, inherent risk, could you elaborate on the related considerations to keep in mind? Yeah, absolutely. So inherent risk is, is the risk in the absence of controls. Um, what we find, and also any kind of framework before you do a risk assessment, you have to have a risk register. You have to have your risk defined. So that's part of a standard enterprise risk management framework. Every organization is going to have that. Um, 
we happen to be most familiar, and I've seen this in many organizations, you take um, a given risk, it's a library of risk, they're well-defined, and then they're also, the likelihood and the impact um, is, is, is in there. So um, I, I think in our, in our world, uh, unlike business units, technology is unique. Virtually everything in technology is going to be high inherent risk. Almost every risk you can think of associated with tech technology or cybersecurity by nature is high. You contrast that with a business unit such as finance or uh, accounting or um, human resources. You may very well have a moderate inherent risk based on your analysis and assessment because you simply don't have these threat actors or or the, de the degree and pace of change that would cause your overall inherent risk to be be higher. Do we have anything to add to that? No, I don't think so. I think you covered that pretty well. The just the inherent risk of technology, very rarely will that ever not be high um, without controls. Yeah. Would this be why um, enterprises has has to identify from top to bottom the risk the risk factors in their environment? I was just curious about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, we're, we're so focused on the uh, technology risk assessment, which is the end product of the framework we just alluded to at the beginning of the call. Uh, the reality is, before you even attempt a risk assessment, you have to have a framework. You have to have a risk appetite defined. You have to have a management framework about how you approach risk and it goes back to things like defining in a document for all to see uh if you're using a three-point scale or five-point scale for inherent or residual risk and giving guidance on how you determine what your inherent risk is and then underlying that master document which is um basically a standard or a policy document underlying that is you have to have the right technology or at least documented risk register it says you know the lack of um, access management or the lack of, um, or data integrity, um, those kind of risks. And, and that applies not only just to technology, but to, to um, the firm like human resources. Human resources are gonna have slightly different risks. I think in our, in our experience, most of the time, technology has a set of unique risks, whereas businesses may have a set of more common risks, but with some uniqueness to their specific business unit. Does that make sense? Definitely makes sense. And how critical it is to go and and register periodically. Uh, don't let it continue to age. It, as we know in technology, right? Every it's advancing, it's changing. So the risks are changing and and they're evolving. So we need to make sure that that risk register evolves and changes with it. Spot on. Yep. Fantastic. Why do um, quantification fail when it comes to the control environment? Why does quantification fail? Yes. Um, I wouldn't characterize quantification as, as failing. So when it comes to the control environment, the top measure is control effectiveness. You typically find, I've seen organizations use three or four five-point scales, like partially adequate, you know, for control. Typically, though, we kind of keep things binary. They're either effective or ineffective. And I, when you talk about control testing, and Julie's going to be fond of me saying this repeatedly, like, I'm not a big fan of control testing. It implies we're going through a quiz. I'm more of a fan of control evaluation where you evaluate uh, the degree to which a control is operating, right? You're really doing an evaluation. Um, and so when you talk about quantification of controls, the number one item is gonna be the degree of control effectiveness. Um, and as Julie mentioned very clearly, it's not a direct um, factor if, if, for example, your control value is, is high, if you have a high rating, you can't automatically assume you have a strong control environment because you may not have adequate control coverage across the environment. So you, Jeff, as a risk professional, if I'm a, if you're coming to me as your control evaluation team, I can tell you it's 90% effective and um, this is what it means across these domains. So you as a risk professional are gonna make the determination if that 90% is a good number. So when you talk about quantification, so-called failing, I'd say it's less about failing than it's about making erroneous judgments. Um, so if you're representing the CEO or the board of directors and the regulators that you have a strong control environment and you only have five controls and you have all these other failures going here, that's where the quantification aspect becomes uh, challenging or too burdensome, if that makes sense. So, so in, in this evaluation, I mean, because I'm a big fan of evaluating things as well. So, when you evaluate, do you make adjustments as needed 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's where the qualitative benefit comes into the play. So let's say that uh, Julie and team put together a robust picture of, you know, the overall environment from a risk assessment is going to, for example, let's say it's going to be a five point scale range from inadequate to strong. OK, I'm going to start compiling those quantitative facts and the qualitative facts. And you, you, if you think about a control test, if you will, when you evaluate a control, all we're doing is it's like a court case. I am doing a second party judgment on how well that control is operating in the environment. And in order to do that, I'm running through test procedures and I am writing up a briefing that says to the world, here's why I'm calling this effective, because this happened, this happened, this happened. There were no exceptions. Uh, and this is it. And and so I am defending, if you will, my, my judgment. Then when Julie and I get together as a team and we provide to the risk partners, our inherent risk is X, our, our control environment is adequate. Here's why it's adequate, because we have 90% effectiveness across a large number of domains with 500 controls, for example. Our metrics, 85% of them are in within threshold and have passed. Our KRIs, our findings and issue management process, we have a low degree of high findings, which could be critically devastating to a, a unit. All these factors inform your qualitative judgment um, on, on how you determine the environment and your eventually your res residual risk rating against risk appetite. Julie, you have anything to add to that? Uh, I was just going to expand a little bit more on your, the issue management that, that you called out there. Um, it's really a critical addition to just the control environment. We go back to that very basic example of five controls, 100%, great, but it seems like you've got some gaps. Uh, or maybe you have a large control environment and it's 85% effective, but then if you add in the piece of the issue management, hey, we have 20 high critical self-identified open findings that we don't really tie into these controls too much. That paints a, a clearer picture too, in addition to those metrics, in addition to those controls to say, here's a little bit more uh, quantitative, quantitative evidence to show either we're there or we're not. So, so with that quantitative evidence, um, I guess that will focus, that will focus more on the assets itself. Yeah, typically it's going to be, well, not always. Like it's going to be assets, definitely. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll have um, those kind of technology asset focus, right? Um, you know, in our in our world, we also there's a, a asset control assessment process where you determine the risk of assets and things like that. So that becomes not just monetary data, but also a risk assessment of the, of individual assets, and that definitely factors into it. So if you're going to take a complete robust picture from a technology self-assessment, you're going to have uh, a, a way of measuring your assets. You're going to have a way of putting the metrics pieces together, putting the KPI pieces together, um, putting the control environment figures together, all those which work in conjunction to give you a holistic view of A, the, the, the strength of your environment, the, the, the quality of your risk assessment, and, and, and B, any future work. Let's not forget the risk assessment, once you, you're not just done pencils down, once you have a risk assessment, you're gonna also identify um, next steps or, or or gaps that you want to address or areas of focus for the organization to further strengthen based on your risk appetite. That's interesting. And so I, I want to tie that to how often should companies do a risk assessment? I think it, it's going to depend on the organization and, and what their environment really entails, right? With uh, a, We're from a banking institution. Something a little bit more frequently, we do an assessment every quarter, uh, but there are things we're doing constantly, not, you know, outside of that quarterly uh, schedule. So I, th I think it really depends on uh, a couple factors based on your, your environment, your organization, what kind of uh, industry you're in and, and things like that. Yeah, I'll pull on that thread really too, because uh, if you're in a highly regulated one like banking or insurance, mm -hmm. you're going to do it more often. If you're uh, less regulated, you, you may not even have one, but you may do it every periodically every two years. So we, we've seen typically, though, Jeff, direct answer to your question. Typically, it's annual. Typically. Definitely makes sense. I used to see um, some companies, I'll see them addressing instead of uh, like they would do assessments every year, but you'll see them throughout the year adjusting controls. Absolutely. That's mm -hmm. that's part of the, you know, uh, we're, we're familiar. Julie loves me talking about our factory model. Um, factories to us are widgets. They're, they're items that have to be defined. 
They have to be uh, analyzed. They have to be uh, outlined procedures. You have to have evidence that's accurate and available. And then your control environment throughout the year, uh, whether you do a quarterly or an annual risk assessment, that is a dynamic living environment, right? So you're always not just growing controls uh, if you have gaps or you want additional coverage, but you're also consolidating controls. You're you're narrowing down the control environment. You get you want it's important from a control environment to get it right, not not necessarily focus on the total amount. I often get challenged by CIOs uh, and, and other technologists, Mike. What is the right number, and is ninety percent correct? And I, I often use the analogy that it's not about the number; it's about having the right coverage and the right risk mitigation in place. And then they, they always enjoy seeing ninety percent effectiveness. But I encourage them; that's not a pass fail grade. It, think of it as a, a a a temperature gauge. If it's ninety degrees outside, you're not putting a winter coat on. If it's 12 degrees outside, you better have that winter coat on. So that number is a barometer or a temperature gauge of the environment only, and it's more important to understand what you're using it for in your analysis. So why would residual risk assessment objectives and facts and quantification elements that contrast each other? I'm just curious about that. Because sometimes I'll have issues where um, we perform this assessment. We have some controls that we put in place. Have you ever put one in place where it, you, it, it caused other issues, like like once you stop putting controls in? Well, Jeff, you have to understand something. I run an organization called Center of Excellence. We, <laughs> ne we never make mistakes like that, do we, Julie? Never. Never. There you go. No, Jeff, it, it does happen. You're absolutely yeah. right. I mean, Julie, you, you, you live and breathe this stuff every day. Do you have an example of what Jeff was just saying? Yeah, I, I don't know that I have a specific example, but it, it does happen, right? You you in, you implement one thing and somehow it breaks something else. Or you implement one thing and you think, hey, this is going to be great and it's going to solve all of our problems, right? It's going to kind of create, here's an area uh, that is a little bumpy and I'm going to implement controls, uh, a new product here that's going to slow those ripples and really it's going to solidify our control environment in that area. And, and it doesn't go as planned. And so you have to kind of go back to the drawing board with with the technology, with the cyber folks and say, OK, how do how do we address this and how do we clean it up uh, so that we have a sound control environment from here? Yeah, I, I, Julie, hearing you speak gave me a, a thought too, to Jeff's point. Um, most of the time we see it when you adopt a new system and we put controls around a new system, many people just implement systems without regard to controls. So yeah. what happens is, um, what I mean by that, let me give you a concrete example. We had a, an access management system one time being implemented and the reporting that we needed for testing wasn't automated or built in the beginning. Um, so we put in these controls and control tests and what happened was we were causing the business a lot of angst because they spent a lot of time doing manual reports. So that's a great example of where a control was implemented and the knock-on effect was additional manual labor hours to put all these reports together uh, for these thousands of accounts, you know? So that's that's a pretty good example there. My challenge was always visibility. It was um, having the visibility to be able to report these analytics back to the stakeholders. That was always a challenge. I, I, absolutely. When you talk about it, that's why, um, and it's always, you have to keep in mind, and I, I, I'll, double down on that 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 challenge so not only the stakeholders you're dealing with second line in a defense and depth strategy operational risk they'll challenge you um audit third line will challenge you um the stakeholder the board of directors will challenge you stakeholders who you're putting in failing controls will challenge you and ultimately the regulators will challenge you so that's why i go back to my control evaluation statement it's like going to the supreme court with a brief you have to have all your data and your and your subjective opinions locked and loaded so that you can remove the challenges, remove the obstacles. So when you say, hey, I have all these great things going on, my control environment is adequate, nobody can argue with you. But Jeff, as you know, as a risk professional yourself, someone's always going to argue with you. Yes. Oh, yes, they will. <laughs> would there be anything else you would like to tell our audience? Uh, no, this has been a great experience for Julie and I. Um, this is our passion. This is what we spend our days doing. So to have the chance to uh, share our, our our techniques and our view is, is, is an honor, a privilege. So we really appreciate everybody's time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike and Julie. Uh, we probably could talk about this all day. <laughs> and I, I honestly don't mind because those answers were fantastic. You can read the full article if you click the link below. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Jeff Champion.